Welcome. Quinn Thong. Now, you are based in Hong Kong and are a qualified accountant and have served in senior financial and operational roles for multinational corporations. You are Managing Director of Asia Wilmington, a corporation dedicated to training financial professionals. And in the way I'm going to introduce the next component is I will describe you as a creative accountant, not in the way it's meant, but you are the co-author of a children's book, The Art of Wealth Management for Kids, published by Oxford University Press. And you also co-founded and run Anna by Karma, an award-winning social enterprise that you founded in Bhutan with a mission to empower poor, illiterate Bhutanese women to become financially independent. And that is how we know each other. So I can't wait to talk about that as well during this uh, interview. Now, even as I introduce you, uh, it seems clear that collaboration has played a significant role in your career. Can I start by asking you how you feel that collaborations have enabled you to evolve your career and take you on new and exciting adventures and challenges? Collaboration is the key to everything I do, whether it's work or writing the book and definitely Anna by Karma. Uh, for example, writing the book, I actually wrote it with a Pakistani accountant whom I've never met in person. We wrote it on Skype, on I don't know, WeChat, on emails, and we met during the book launch two years later. So that's collaboration at the highest level. And with the women that I work with in Bhutan, they do not speak English. They do not come from our world. They live in villages. They're probably not even visited their own capital. So collaborating with them means understanding them as best as I can. And... Um, apart from working with the women, it's also working with people like yourselves, you know? How do I get to leverage your strengths, your networks, your talents, your ideas, to bring them all home to Anna Barkama and make it all come together? So collaboration is the only thing that's holding all of this together and lots of uh, smiles. <laughs> now, obviously dealing with, you're based in Hong Kong and Anna Baikama is based in Bhutan. Now, the distance is really huge. I would imagine that uh, obviously uh, the technology that you're now using with the collective has improved since you've started working with them. In the early days, how did you ensure that you were able to communicate effectively to get a quality product out into the market? You really ask all the ouch questions. Uh, I didn't. I didn't know how to do it. So when, I mean, the way this started was I met a poor illiterate housewife in the village and I thought I could help her once off by giving her a certain amount to buy a sewing machine and start her home business. She didn't want my money. Uh, so instead, I offered to sell something from her. What, what was supposed to be one off became like 40 pieces, 100 pieces, 1,000 pieces in, in 16 weeks at 1,000 pieces, that's when I really panic because I have no idea how to give her the money. She doesn't have a bank account. Uh, I have no idea how she's going to send me the stuff because she's illiterate. She can't write like the post notes. So we got monks to carry it on their backs in the planes and brought me to Hong Kong. I go to the temples to collect it and um, I give cash to the monks to bring back hoping that it will reach them so it started in a very primitive way um, but of course today all the women are banked so i could transfer into the bank accounts like we do proper business women um, i've given them uh, uh, mobile phones so i collect all mobile phones from my friends to give to them and we communicate on wechat so I can't really talk to them. I took the pictures. I speak the best English I can slowly and the children translate for them. So we have come a long way. So a lot of my women uh, sisters are rather in Bhutan. They have little mobile phones to help them communicate to each other, but also with me. So, and uh, yeah, we are kind of cool now. Now, I would describe the... Um the collective is very much a multi-level collaboration. You have a collective of women spread across the country who need to 
coordinate their efforts. How did you go about uh, bringing your collaboration, knowledge and expertise to the women and encouraging them to start adopting that collaborative mindset to build a business? Mm, it's again a very uh, good question. I wish you asked all these questions before I started all this because I scratch my head all the time like how oh, I could do this. So I remember my very first meetings. Oh, all this started in 2014 without me knowing it started. By by the time we saw a thousand pieces and the whole village was working for what was forming to be Anna by Karma, I started to think, no, 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 this is not working. I have to go back and like, get them organized because we're totally disorganized, you know? You cannot rely on monks carrying scarves over as a business. So I, I went back and set up a curriculum and we have what we call a WOW session, W-O-W, Weavers Over Achiever Workshop. So I, I wanted them to learn standards, quality, what, what is quality in our minds, and we wanted them to know if I say this scarf, this red scarf is this red scarf, not that red scarf or that green scarf. So it's very simple. And then as they progress in quality and in designs, then we moved on to budgeting, stock keeping, you know, proper business things. And by 2016, two years later, they have their own trust fund, which they run themselves and organize so that they, their children get scholarship and they get medical help. And in the case of funeral expenses for their parents, this is also looked after. So they start to get the mindset like this is not just about weaving a scarf and then pushing it off to someone to sell. This is about a business. So it's about changing their mindsets from very start, like how to weave this nicely to how to run this trust fund for the betterment of your community and your family. So we've come a long way. And I, I, I just want to, after this, show you some photos of transformation. You can see it on their face. So many of them have become so beautiful, so sophisticated looking. This trip, which was just last week, I actually cried tears of joy to see that they've not only transformed in, in terms of they've earned more money for their family, but that look of like, hmm, I'm a good businesswoman. That sort of look. I wish I have that beauty and sophistication as well, you know. I can't wait to show you the photos, miss. Well, I believe you do have that beauty and sophistication. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll look at it. Now, one thing that has I found very interesting and we've interviewed a few speakers about this topic of co-creation. Mm -hmm. So really about how the, your customers have helped you evolve the product according to their tastes and needs and also how the weavers themselves have put their own creativity into it to create something new. So I was just wondering if you could talk about the role that customers and your weavers have played to evolve this product and co-create it into a far superior product. Oh, fantastic question again. Um, what happens is our customers are not just our customers who come and pick a piece like, okay, I wanna buy this and run away. They actually care about us. So they look at our products and say, do you think if we added some pink lines or we did this way or that way, it will work? And I'll go like, oh, let's try. And, and more than often, their suggestion works so well. Um, I'm going to send you some scarves that, that has done the best because it was from the ideas of the customer. Um, the other thing was uh, we make waist belt. I mean, we means the women make waist belt, their traditional needs for, to tie up their clothes, you know, when they wear it. And once I had that waist belt on my desk at work and my colleague came by talking to me and then she looked at the waist belt and said, hey, is that a luggage belt? And I looked at her like, a luggage belt? She said, yeah, is that a luggage belt? I said, a luggage belt? I, and she was looking at me. I used to pay a lot. And she said, yes, a luggage belt. And I said, it will be. And that's how the luggage belt came about from the waist belt. So what we did about co-creation then was then I worked with some IT people. We have a app that allows you, the customer, to choose your color, choose your patterns, and of course, put your name on it. And the women then take that piece and make it. So we use technology from our end. We use their creativity and their coloring and their weaving to put it all together to become a product for you. 
So yes, uh, the weavers also have learned a lot from this process of um, understanding that technology and customer play such an important role in your weaving. Because if I go back to those days in 2014, they make whatever they like. I have to sell whatever they make. I have no choice. And I said, this is not the world we live in. The customer makes the choice. And so now they understand and they make things that we want. So that we have come a long way. Long way, a long way. And I'm so proud of everything that you've done and that women have achieved. It's extraordinary. And it just shows that that confidence that comes from making a sale and, and building a business and feeling empowered. I mean, that's really what's at the heart of social enterprise. And I was wondering if you could share what you feel have been your key ingredients or elements to ensuring a successful, sustainable collaboration within a social enterprise context. I I go back to the saying of Mother Teresa. She said not all of us could do great things, but each one of us, we can do small things with great love. So more often than ever, I'll go and think like, why am I doing this? This is so hard. And then I remember that all I have to do is a small thing, like sell one scarf or, or ask someone, ask you for one help. But with, with, a, if with a great intention to make it well. So to hold all this together, I also encourage all my friends and even the weavers who work with us, don't think of big things. Think of one small thing you can do to move yourself forward. And I think that has helped me a lot. Otherwise, I don't think we could have come this far if I tried to do too much um, on my own or with them. So, and, and this way, doing small things with great love, I think has inspired a lot of professionals like ourselves to say, okay, I can do that one small thing. And that's how we built our business around everyone's love. How has what you have learned from this experience with Anna Baikama transferred back into your corporate life? You know, um, some years ago, I, I mean, two years ago, I was doing this. I had a war map and I brought vegetables from the kitchen, like chili, tomato, not, not the tomato, onions and uh, cucumber. And with that, I taught them foreign currency. All right, and, and that was just very normal for an accountant to do, right? Teach with vegetables. So, and, and a professor from Nottingham University was there. He observed all of it, and then he said, you know, Queen, I know why Anna Baikama is successful. I'm like, why, why? Tell me, tell me. And then he said, because you could do, you could teach in very simple terms, and he called it absorptive capacity. I'm like, what does it mean? So he means that it's not what you teach, is how much they can absorb that makes the difference. So being able to make very complex things into very simple, like forex into vegetables, he said, this is, this is something that enables everyone to move forward with you. And I think when I realized that is the key to working with the weavers who are so different from me, and then use this back in corporate, whereby you could be training a new trainee who just start work for the first day, or you could be working with, like I work with people from UK, they may not entirely understand how to work in China or in India or Singapore. And, and so being able to translate that to the terms that they can refer to makes it all easier for all of us to progress. So I think this absorptive capacity it's something that I can bring to corporate life and make my life so much easier in corporate now. And um, yeah, we have, I have a great, great time at corporate now. So I have all the time now after work to work on what I want to work. And at work, I just transfer the capability to my team so that they can take it on. So there's so much in that, especially in your ability to, to have a corporate life and also be an entrepreneur. And, you know, a lot of people think that they are mutually exclusive, but they're not. And I hope that for the audience uh, who are potentially in jobs and are kind of thinking about, you know, can they explore their more entrepreneurial side, do more impact in the world, make do greater good in the world, they're not mutually exclusive. And, and you're a testament to 
to that, that you've been able to build something so impactful and substantial that has had a significant impact on Bhutan uh, and the women weavers and the reputation of Bhutan as well globally as, as the happy scarves uh, spread around the world and that message goes around that, you know, it can be achieved. And uh, I'm just so thrilled for the success that the weavers have had and will continue to have. Uh, below your interview, I will have all the links uh, to Anna by Karma, where people can purchase a scarf if they want to support the weavers. And I'll also put the article that I wrote uh, about, uh, about the enterprise in there as well. So people can find out more about Bhutan. It's obviously been uh, reported to be the happiest place on the planet. Uh, obviously a very peaceful, wonderful place to visit as well. And what this shows is that with technology, what you've proven, distance is, it's irrelevant. You know, you've been able to publish a book with someone you've never met. You've been able to, you know, train people. You've been able to build an enterprise all through technology. And so, again, I want the audience to take away that fear around barriers. Yes. You know, you're working with a, a country where English is not their language. You're working with illiterate women where, you know, language is difficult, written language is difficult, uh, and you've been able to create something. It's totally inspiring, Quinn. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us at the Small Business Collaboration Summit. Thank you, Miss. I always love working with you and great questions. Now you're making me think a lot. <laughs>